Every once in a while, I get recommendations from viewers for games I should check out. This week's review comes at request by Dante Perry 7692 who said I should check out The Guardian Legend. Guardian Legend, huh? It's been on my to-do list for a while. I've heard it was a fantastic game and one that was often unfairly overlooked. Eh, what the hey, why not? And after giving the game a go, I must say I could not put it down. The Guardian Legend has a simple enough story. A race of aliens are attempting to use the star Naju to take over the Earth, which obviously isn't a very good thing. As a female android guardian, you race towards Naju in an attempt to destroy it. See? Simple. The first stage of the game is exactly that. You racing towards Naju. You will find that the guardian turns into a freaking spacecraft, jetting towards Naju at breakneck speeds. And for a person that sucks at overhead shooters, I gotta say, this first stage is intimidating. It took me a few attempts before reaching the boss, which is practically a bullet hell shooter, with the only exception that the enemy's shots can be destroyed by your own. Once this group of turrets is defeated, you enter Naju itself and find that the game is also an overhead adventure game. You are told that someone had tried to set the self-destruct mechanisms and failed. Your goal is to enter multiple underground corridors and destroy the so-called safety devices in order to complete the destruction of Naju. So here's what that all means. You run around in an overhead world, which can be thought of as the base of Naju. You are looking for any item that will help you out, whether it be power-ups, weapons, or so on. Eventually, you'll encounter rooms called corridors. There are 20 of these, and act as the dungeons of the game. Each of these corridors are considered the underground areas, and all function as overhead shooters, not unlike the intro stage. Clear the boss of this corridor, and that area is complete, causing the room to be destroyed. Then it's on to the next corridor. Things aren't so clear-cut, though. There's a bit of a puzzle element to the game in regards to actually opening up the shoot 'em up stages. Some of the doors open right up, but others require you to perform a specific task. These range from simply blasting the door a few times, to unequipping your secondary weapon, to even re-entering the room multiple times. Thankfully, Naju has hints scattered around that were left behind by the mysterious force that attempted to destroy the star previously. And unlike Castlevania 2, the hints are very well translated, so it's not a mystery as long as you spend the extra minute or so exploring the star. So yeah. You run around the overhead levels and blast aliens that appear in ways similar to the original Legend of Zelda. You have infinite ammo in your main gun, and even better, holding down the B button allows you to rapid fire it. You can also fire in 8 directions, so that's helpful too. As you defeat the enemies, you'll find various power-ups that get dropped in capsules. Hearts replenish your life, blue characters increase your max health, and red characters increase your max power chip limit. And what are these power chips? Well, their use is twofold. One, you use it as a sort of currency in the few shops that you'll encounter. These shops are never required, and usually either give you a weapon or a powered up. The second use is for your secondary weapons, as the chips power them. Each sub-weapon has a different chip use, and the game helpfully tells you how many shots you have remaining. You'll definitely want to find chips, as the sub-weapons can be crucial in late game stages. So hunt down those blue and red orbs to regain your chip counts. Kinda sorta third reason to grab chips is to increase the ability of your main shots. Once the amount of chips in your inventory reaches certain thresholds, your bullets will morph into something more powerful. For example, increase their width and power. This is really important, as once you reach later segments of Naju, you'll find that enemies take a lot more shots. And if you rely on your chips too much, you'll find that your shot gets degraded, making survival a bit more difficult. Thankfully, there are a lot of sub-weapons, and each has their uses. In addition, each can get powered up two additional times. This may increase the amount of chips they require per shot, yet at the same time, the extra strength or size of the projectile is usually worth it. I found the sub-weapon where you launch a massive fireball to be one of the best due to the sheer power of it. Yet in the corridors, the shot that looks kind of like an arc was my preferred weapon, although in late game stages, I got dangerously close to running out of chips. I should probably talk about the corridors more. You get the same health, shot, chips, and side weapons that you do in the overhead areas of Naju. The main difference is just the way that the game plays. Power-ups do seem to be a bit more frequent here, which is awesome, again, due to the extreme difficulty spikes near the end of the game. Unfortunately, there's not a huge variety of enemies that you'll encounter in these areas. Corridors in the same areas of Naju typically have the same enemies, although they do often change in other regions. 
bosses, along with the mini-bosses, also tend to get recycled. The real differences are just speed of the attacks and maybe a different shot pattern, but once you figure out how to defeat the first of its kind, you probably won't have a problem with the next. What does help, though, is that most boss projectiles can be destroyed, giving you additional power-ups to keep you alive for longer. And yes, you will die. Thankfully, there are infinite continues, and if you did want to stop, there is a password that you can jot down. Even better, the game easily distinguishes what letters are lowercase, a feature I wish more games would have adopted. It's a bit odd that instead of just seeing the password, you have to enter the password room and unequip your side weapon before pressing A, but eh, it works. Interestingly enough, dying and continuing doesn't erase your score, which I suppose makes sense since you only really have one life. But the score is actually more than just bragging rights. Reaching certain score checkpoints will increase your maximum life meter by a notch. So even if you are struggling in a corridor, just keep blasting things as you might eventually get one extra little blip on your health meter, allowing you to survive that one last hit before you can take down the boss. Another feature the game gives you to assist in your task is an in-game map. It's useful to an extent, as rooms that you need to get to flash red. In addition, on the bottom of the screen, you'll always see an X and Y coordinates, allowing you to write notes if you need to remember something. Personally, I drew myself a map as I played, as you see here. It helped me a lot, both to mark off areas that I've been, along with corridors I've completed, as the game is fairly large, clocking in at 24 rooms by 24 rooms, not including the corridors. But those are linear shoot 'em up levels, so they don't count. The sound isn't necessarily anything you'll remember, with average music that does the job and sound effects that, quite honestly, start to pierce your eardrums after a while. Well, to clarify, it's the shot sound effects that can get a bit grating, but it's fine. You'll tune it out. But the graphics? For a game released in 88, I was impressed. The Guardian herself looks fantastic, enemies are detailed, and there's a surprising amount of chaos on the screen at any one time. Even with all of the enemy bullets, my shots, and the enemy themselves, I've never noticed the flicker. Yes, it exists, but the game does a great job at distracting you with the action, so you don't really take notice. In addition to this, there's a crazy amount of speed in some of the corridors. The intro level alone threw stuff at you so fast, not allowing you to ease into the game. There's also a cool scene of your guardian morphing into her flying model, showing off some sweet animation. I will admit that the overhead sections don't look as fantastic, but again, with all the enemies being thrown at you, you might not notice. If there was one thing I had to complain about, what would it be? Well, the final corridor is a boss rush. Thankfully, you don't fight every single boss you've already run into, otherwise that would be agonizing with about 20 different bosses. After this, you fight the big bad alien creature, which I struggled with at first until finding out I could just hide in the top left corner and let my secondary shots take care of the villain. It's also a bit disappointing that you don't get different boss music for this. I always hated that in games. But he died, and you get an eh kind of ending. Even so, I was not upset, as I could finally put the game down. My thumbs literally hurt because I was pressing down the controller so hard, and I've been doing so for hours. You were also given a final password of TGL, which apparently allows you to play all of the corridors in order with power-ups given to you after defeating bosses. Hmm, I may have to stream that attempt at some point. It's really surprising that I've slept on the Guardian Legend for so long, as it's one of the best games I've played in a while. I played this game on one of my weekends start to finish and could not stop until the final boss was defeated. Alright, I took some breaks, but I didn't play a lot of other stuff. This game really is a must-play. It's part adventure, part shooter, and all fun. Thanks Dante Perry for the recommendation, as I can now recommend the game to you, the viewer. Final score? 7 out of 7. This is Reaper. Happy fragging.